Well, we have the, the privilege of having the, f the president of our Every Nation family in North America, but we have the First Lady with us. And Cynthia Fuller is going to start out, and I believe she's going to make an entrance from here. Five feet, ten and a half inches tall. Drop dead gorgeous. One of 13 children from Memphis, Tennessee, had seven children of her own. That's right. Believe it or not, here she is, preceding her husband. Come on, stand to your feet and welcome the first lady here. That's better. That's better. You may be seated. She grew up having to get water from a creek, then have to pump it. That was an upgrade. And then finally running water late in life, and then the rest of it's absolutely amazing. I just want to say things about hot dogs. They're very bad for you. Aloha. It's so good to be here with you. Um, my husband and I are here. Uh, this is our, I think, our ninth day. We were in Maui for about five, seven days, I guess, somewhere around there, um, ministering there on the island of Maui, and now we're here in Honolulu, and we are so happy to be here. Hawaii is wonderful. Hawaiian people are wonderful. You're so nice and kind and just have made us feel so special. We appreciate it, and of course, your land is beautiful. So thank you all so much um, for being such a blessed people and blessing us as we're here. Well, we love Pastor Norman and Faye. We've enjoyed um, having dinner with them and getting to be with them. This is my first time being here with you, um, and I'm happy to get to see you. My husband's visited before. But as Pastor Norman was just saying, I grew up, just to tell you a little bit about myself, to add on to what he's done, he's done a great job. But I'm one of 13. Uh, grew up in Tennessee, the South, um, and my dad was an amazing man. He's no longer with us, and my mom is an amazing woman. Um, they farmed. We had gardens all around our house. We had pigs. We had chickens. It was a humble beginning by many, circ by many um, of comparisons. However, it was rich for us because we had family all around. We had love all around. And we had the goodness of hard work, and God was blessing us and our family as we were doing this. But I didn't have Jesus in my heart. So I was growing up with all of these things. And then by my junior year in high school, I played basketball. I think, um, I don't know if Pastor Norman said that because I was in the back, but I actually did not play in college, but I played in high school and was um, played all throughout my high school years um, and thought about playing in college. But anyways... During that, my junior year in high school, I started to feel this emptiness in my soul. It had always been there, but I didn't know it. I had been growing up and enjoying my family life, enjoying my friends, enjoying just the freedom of where we lived. It was, I loved where I grew up, and still to this day. Relatives all around, very safe, and just a wonderful experience with, along with my siblings. Well, my junior year, I started to get sad. My heart just got sad, and I just couldn't figure out. I was like, what's going on with me? And then I was faced with this whole reality that there's something inside of me as a person that would live on forever, but I didn't know where that would be. I didn't know what my eternal situation was. was. So it started to come to the surface in my heart which I learned as I got older was God's way of knocking at the door of my heart. I couldn't have come to that on my own. I'd already lived till I was in 11th grade and nothing like this ever came to me. I'd been, I wasn't, an, I didn't go to church every Sunday, but I would go to church and I had family friends who would talk about church or who sang in the choir and all this, but nothing ever hit my heart like what was going on when I was a junior in high school. And I was searching to find out what this feeling was. It was unlike anything else I'd ever, ha I'd ever felt. And it was empty, and it was kind of with pain as well. And so I started searching to find out what is going on with me, what is happening to me at this point in my life. There was a good friend in school who was a Christian and read their Bible. 
And so he said, he and his um, cousin, she played on the basketball team with me. They said, we'll do a Bible study with you. Maybe this is something that will help you. Because I was like, do you know what life is about? This is, these are the kind of questions I started asking. Do you know what life is about? I remember sitting with my home economics teacher going, do you know what life is about? And do you know God? And she was looking at me like, well, I, I don't know that I can answer your question. She didn't have a perfect answer for me because obviously I know now she didn't know God. So my friends started saying, well, let me do some Bible studies with you. So I started reading the Bible with them. Long and short of it, it started to feed my emptiness. It made sense. It was solid. It was foundational. It was immovable. It was something that could not be overthrown by this life. And it just stuck with me. And I started reading the Bible for myself. Then my friend told me, my cousin, who actually had given her heart to the Lord, came home for, from her college experience. This was before I'd gone into college. And she had actually completely turned her life around by giving her heart to Jesus. So she told me her story. And then she introduced me to the word repentance. And when she introduced me to the word repentance, which means to turn from your sins, to confess your sins to uh, God, and ask Christ to come live in your heart and dedicate your life to him. Let him rule in your heart. Let, open the door for him to come in your heart. But when she, entered, when she told me about that, I knew that that was the key to my heart. That's what was missing. That's what God had been unfolding and uncovering in my life. So at that point, I asked God to come into my heart, forgive me for my sins, and transform my life. And he came in to my heart and transformed and changed me. And I literally, literally felt my heart turn from what it was into something new. I was a changed girl. And from that point on, I lived my life as a believer and have been growing and loving God ever since then. And, um, you know, so I have a scripture for you. And it's in Psalms 105, verses. Psalm 105, verses uh, 37. It says, Then he brought them out with silver and gold, and among his tribes there was not one who stumbled. And this is a scripture talking about, it's, it's talking about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. But it also has a right now meaning for us. It means when God brings us out of a life of sin, a life that is not serving him, he brings us out with silver and gold. So he does something inside of us. He doesn't do it externally. It's an internal thing. He goes deep inside and he creates something of himself within us. He forgives us for our sins and he deposits something of himself in us. And then the silver and gold is what he allows us to gain new in our lives. One of my favorite scriptures is, he took away my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh because I couldn't love him with my heart of stone. I had to have a heart of flesh, so he changed my heart. But he said he, he brought him out, and that's, that also speaks of character. It speaks of the nature of God. It speaks of things that are eternal. It's, it speaks of changes. It speaks of things that are long-lasting. So the silver and gold is what God gives to us. And then it says, and among his tribe, there was not one who stumbled. And this is saying that God, what God begins, he is faithful to complete it. He doesn't just start us on a track and leave us, but he invites us in, and he keeps us there, and he does not let us stumble. He's there with us always. So that's my blessing to you. Silver and gold is what the Lord has for you. If he's knocking at the door of your heart, or if he's already in your heart, Receive what he's giving to you and let him change your life. Thank you so much. God bless you. Now we have an opportunity to hear from the, uh, a, a leader in our Every Nation movement. He leads our North American church family. He pastors a, an amazing church in uh, Washington, D.C. called Grace Covenant Church. They actually have a brand new building, which we're jealous of, but God is blessing them tremendously. And he's also the chaplain for the Washington Redskins. Any Redskins fan in the house? None. All right. <laughs> Tough crowd, but why don't you do me a favor and help me welcome our... Uh, can we all stand to our feet and help me welcome... Uh, bringing the word tonight, Pastor Brett Fuller.
<laughs> uh, no Redskins fans. But I bet there's some Cowboy fans in here. Yeah. Well, at least it's not hostile territory. It's great to be with you. We, Cynthia and I, we love your pastors. Pastor Norman and Faye are amazing human beings. Pastor Billy Lyle, Kalai, everybody. You, you are really blessed to have the leadership you've got. And you don't know it unless you go someplace else and realize this doesn't exist many places. Now, I have the privilege of hanging around a lot of Christian leaders, a lot of churches, both in every nation and outside of every nation. And this is special. This is really special. And you would do well to make sure that you make it a priority in your life to pray for them on a regular basis, to honor them, to appreciate them, to do special things, to make their job a joy. The writer of Hebrews says, those who rule well among you, make sure that you make their job a happy job. Because when they're happy doing their job, they bless you and make you happier. So the reciprocal benefit of making them happy is that you get happy. Do all you can to make sure that your leadership is provided for spiritually by praying for them and blessing them. Can you say amen to that? Also, I'm grateful for my bride who shared. Thank you, Cynthia. That was some good stuff. Good stuff. We've been married. We're celebrating our 30th year of marriage this year. <clears throat> And uh, gosh, every year has been better than the last. Seven kids, 28, 25, 23, 22, 21, 19, 16. <laughs> Five boys, two girls. And we are really, really happy. Just a little slice of heaven in our house every day. It's like we got an outpost of glory. I love coming in my house. And my bride and I have been partners in raising our children and creating an atmosphere where the presence of God seems to abide, not just visit. And for that, we are very, very grateful. Turn with me over to the book of First Chronicles. First Chronicles. We're going to look at First Chronicles 16, verse 8. First Chronicles 16, verse 8. The title of the message tonight is Primary Words primary words. First Chronicles 16, verse 8. David is speaking, and he says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Lord, help us as we study. You all will have to overlook the sound of my voice tonight. Um, I'm just struggling with whatever is down there that shouldn't be there. So I'm going to navigate around it. Let me give you the background to this passage. David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem for the first time. Now, Jerusalem has recently become his capital city. Before he was king, his predecessor, Saul, had his capital city as Gibeah. And David said, I want Jerusalem to be the capital city. But David had a heart that was different than any other, obviously, monarch. There had only been one prior to him. And Saul surely didn't serve God as he should. But he was different than any other judge who had judged prior. And that David had a heart for worship. And he instituted some things that no other leader had done in Israel. There was a prescribed way that God said, I want to be worshipped. And indeed, you needed to worship according to how he said. But it didn't mean you couldn't do a little bit more. And David was the first one to bring song into the presence of God. And he was gifted that way. He was a psalmist. He was a musician. So he didn't just write psalms. He actually sang them and played them. And he orchestrated his government to make sure that people in the house of God were there to worship primarily. They were priests of the tribes of Levi, tribe of Levi. But their job was not to do what most priests did, which was to care for the table of showbread and the candelabra and the articles at the temple, the tabernacle at that time. Their job was to write songs, play instruments, and create choirs and make sure that worship never, ever stopped in God's presence. It's pretty cool. 
And David had brought the Ark of the Covenant in, and this was a moment. But in order to understand the moment and how significant this was, you got to understand where the Ark was not for the better part of a century. So let's go back almost 100 years to when Eli was judge. Now let me give you the progression. Eli was a judge before Samuel. Samuel was the last to judge, and Samuel anointed Saul king. After Saul came David. So we're talking about four generations of leadership for Israel before you get, or three before you get to David, but four in total. And Eli was judging the people. And it was a very difficult time. Eli wasn't a bad judge. He just wasn't a good one. He didn't do wicked stuff, but he did not coordinate his son's activities well at all. He didn't discipline his boys. And his boys were not only priests, but they were supposed to take over for what his dad was doing, their dad was doing. And they were not good priests at all. They were horrible. They were really, really bad. And Eli would not restrain them. And God judged him for that and for other things. The people of Israel were struggling during this time. They were doing their best to try to overcome their, the enemies of the land. But the Philistines were continually beating them in battle. And they said, we're tired of losing. So they said, we, we're going to go out to battle this time. But, but we don't want to get beat. So we need a good luck charm. We need a rabbit's foot. And they said, we're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle with us. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was that which God created to, to be the representation of his presence on earth. It was a box about two feet wide, two feet in, in height, and, two, and about a, uh, 18 inches tall. And on the inside of this box, there was the, the Ten Commandments, there was a jar of manna and Aaron's rod that was a dead stick, yet in the presence of God, budded, leaved, flowered, and bore fruit in one night. Boy, what a great story. It doesn't matter how dead you are. The power of God can make you alive and fruitful in a hurry. That ought to give you encouragement. You don't have to wait until you get a seminary degree to be fruitful. My pastor had me at two weeks on campus at Indiana University preaching the gospel. Two weeks after I got born again. And I mean on campus at the student union when everybody was eating lunch. He asked me to stand up on a wall and give my testimony. I was scared to death. I said, I don't even know my scripture. I don't know what. I'm not a preacher. That's not what I do. I'm a biology major. This doesn't work well with me. I'm not trained to do. He said, do it. I got up there and I shared everything I knew in about a minute and a half. And as I got talking, I thought, I like this. It's pretty good. <laughs> I felt a pull on my pants. My pastor was tugging on me because I was on a wall. He was down there. He said, come down. I came down. I thought, was that good? He said, no, it was terrible. <laughs> terrible. I said, really? He said, yeah, it was bad. But you have potential. Two weeks later, I was out there doing it on my own. A month from then, I was gathering people with pop psychology and pseudo-philosophy, asking people as they were walking by, do you believe in absolutes? And of course, everybody thought there were no absolutes because they have, if they have to submit to absolutes, that means that there is somebody who made them, and then we have to talk about who did that. And so they'd say, no, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure about that? Because if you don't believe there's an absolute, then by default, you're making that an absolute. And now you made it an absolute. And what makes you absolutely sure you can do that? Which would then gather a crowd. And we'd have this debate going on. Oh, it was beautiful. And then from that, I'd spring into preaching the gospel. We saw people born again every week. My point is, you don't have to wait until you need some certification from somebody to preach the gospel. You got the word in your mouth. He could make a dead stick live. This ark, they said, we need now it to be moved from the, from the tabernacle into battle. And so we want to take it with us. So Eli said, okay, great. Now, this was one of the first times this had ever happened. And uh, what, what happens if they lose? Well, they never thought they would. Not with the ark of the presence. So they take it into battle and they lose. 
See, the people weren't doing right. You can't ask God to come bless your mess. If you're not living right, please don't think he's going to give you victory simply because you pray a prayer. He's not your good luck charm. I live in the environment of athletics and everybody wants a prayer before the game. Everybody. They could have done some serious dirt two nights earlier, but they want prayer before the game. And you talk to any chaplain, that's not just for the Redskins. Everybody wants prayer. God, help me. I got three hours to justify my existence in this city. Help me to do great. And I pray for them. That's my job. That's my job. But sometimes God doesn't answer. Not only did Israel lose, the Philistines took the ark, captured it, and they said, oh, oh, this is our big day. We... This, this is like Christmas for us because we captured the presence of the God who opened the Red Sea. This is the God who vanquished the most powerful nation on earth, Egypt, and allowed the Israelites to come out without lifting a sword. We have in him, in our we've captured God. That's what they thought. Anybody know God can't be captured by man? Just FYI. I just... <laughs> It just now, but they thought they had and so they put them up in the, their temple next to their God Dagon and they thought boy this is a tag team right here we can rule the universe with these two gods and the next morning they come into the temple and their God has fallen over <laughs> God loves people if he was really mad at the Philistines about beating up on his people he could have vanquished them in one night could have wiped them out but he wasn't really mad at them he wasn't happy with them but he wasn't mad he loved them so much that he allowed himself to manifest his power in limited ways by knocking over their God to let them know their God was not God because one of the qualities of God is that he doesn't fall down and this God had fallen down and he couldn't get up God doesn't fall down he doesn't do that. He doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't even lean wrong. If he ever falls, he's not God. Something else is. And so they, they, he, he allowed them to say, Dagon falls. That was a cue. Listen, he's not me. He's not me. Serve me. Serve me. And they did what we normally do when we think we are singularly serving God, but we are not as singular as we should be. Meaning, he might be first, but he may not be only. And he's requiring us to make him singular. No other God but him. And we only find that out when the thing that we've been giving much of our attention to, God doesn't bless like we want him to bless it. Oh, Lord, if you help me get this money, I know, I, you know, I'm, I'm not tithing, but if you help me get this money, I'll tithe to you. It, 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 help my stock to grow. I, I should be given to the building program, but, but I'll do it after I get my money here, and I promise you, I'll do some things. But let me get this. Lord, help me in my career. If you, and, 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 and believe me, we can say some things that sound real spiritual because we want them to sound right to God, but our heart can be leaning in the opposite direction. Oh, career, if you will allow me to progress as I should, I'll serve you 80 hours a week. I'll make sure that I miss all of my children's soccer games on Saturday if you'll give me my promotion. Oh, career, help me. Oh, relationship, Lord, let me have him, please. He may not be a believer, but he's got a good job. He's got a good job. He's got a good job. And we break all the principles because we're serving something else other than his purposes. And then when that thing falls over, then we find out exactly what we're serving. Because if we try to prop it back up, then we're really not serving the God of the universe. We're serving our own purposes. The reason God allows that relationship to fall our finances to fall us not to get promoted but somebody else does is so that he can get our attention to say don't serve that serve me are you listening 
Well, what they did is they propped it back up. But they, God, God fell. We need to help him. Next morning they come in. They got us falling over, head cut off, hands cut off. And they say, oh, our God is destroyed now. <laughs> yes, I am him. He's not. Instead of realizing who God was, they send God away. Other things happen. They say we're tired of God. And too often we Christians do that. When he doesn't co-sign our plan, we get mad. Oh, it works for Pastor Norman. It works for Pastor Billy. But it doesn't work for me. He didn't come through like I thought he was supposed to. God, I'm leaving because I want that. Send him right on away. They send him away. Put him on a cart with some oxen carrying it. The oxen run up into Israel now, into Israelite territory. And they wind up at a place called Beth Shemesh. Didn't work out well for the people of Beth Shemesh. They didn't treat God with reverence as the scriptures should, should dictate. And they, they, lots of people died there. Not a good day. And so they sent God on away too. And it wound up at a man's, name, man's house named Abinadab. And for there it stayed for decades. Decades. Until David comes to power. Saul neglected the ark. Never once was it in his reign, in his rule. Could have found it, just didn't have any passion for it. David says, I want this to be in my realm. He goes to Abinadab and says, we're going to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem because it's important for us in our worship. It needs to be a part of my government. And so big parade, everybody's happy. It's been now 90 some odd years since the Ark has been in anybody called Israel's presence any way in government only in a man's house no place else people have worshipped God and sacrificed at a place called Gibeah where the, where the tabernacle is now people have worshipped without the ark day of atonements have passed for 90 years where the priest was to go in and supposed to drop some blood on the mercy seat to atone for the people there's been no mercy seat because the ark is the place where the mercy seat, mercy seat resided they've adopted and adapted other ways of doing worship because the ark wasn't there a, a generation, two generations and a half have gone past and nobody has seen the ark what we have here is a huge moment David tries to bring the ark in and he's got a parade and everybody's working in they're singing hallelujah they're bringing it in just like it was brought in on a cart drawn by oxen hits a bump the ark begins to move, move a little bit a guy named Uzzah reaches out his hand to steady it and when he touches it, Uzzah dies. It's a bad day when somebody dies in church. It's a real bad day, especially when God kills them. It's a bad day. It's not only a bad day then, it's a bad day for many days because everybody walks out saying, uh, I don't think I'm coming next week. Yeah, I'm going to find another church. Um, I love you really, but I want to live. I, I, wanna, I want people die in that church. David goes nuts. I mean, he's thinking, I was trying to do a good thing, and somebody died. <gasps> they park the ark at a man named Obed Edom's house. And David goes back in mourning, thinking, What? God, what? What? And then he finds out three months later that Obed Edom's house is being blessed, prospering. Three months has been there. And David says, wait, maybe God didn't mad at us. Maybe I did something wrong. And then he begins to read his Bible. Can I tell you how important it is for you to read your Bible every day? You need to read your Bible every day. Every day you need to read your Bible. Monday through Sunday you need to read your Bible. Have I been overly redundant enough to let you know and understand how often you need to read your Bible? Because you need to read it every day. It doesn't matter whether something pops out of the scriptures at you and you feel something when you read it. That's not the purpose of your reading. The purpose of your reading is not to feel something. It's to build something. And every day you don't read, it's one less brick you have to build the spiritual house in which you are to dwell. One less brick. This is why you need to read every day. And if you wind up in the book of Numbers... And you have to read the first seven chapters. Don't sit there with an attitude like, 
I need to wait till the good part, don't I? I mean, do I have to read all this? Can I just skip the begats? Can't I do that? No. Because it's his word. And there are things you should gain from his word, even if it seems mundane. And I can't tell you how much information, if you get your, your shovel out and begin to dig, how much great information comes from the begats. Good stuff in there, but you got to work it. And it, again, it does not, doesn't matter whether it feels like something pops off the page. I was out in my backyard. I had a wall built by some stonemasons, and it was a little three-foot wall. It was around a patio, and it was, I don't know, nine to 12 feet long. And these guys had a pile of stones over here, and they were working these pile of stones. And these pile of stones looked completely ill-equipped for the job of building the wall I wanted. They were misshapen. They didn't have any togetherness about them. But these guys who knew how to build the wall looked at these stones and said, these will work. And I was thinking, how in the world are they going to make those make that? And I sat there and watched. And they wa I watched them pick each stone and pick it this way. And it, it wound up being perfectly flat on top, perfectly angled and curved like this. And I sat there and thought, boy, y'all are good. That's right. I couldn't have done that. Mine would have looked all funny looking and bumpy. But during the building of the wall, I never heard one of them. When they put one stone against another, go, whoa! Oh, I feel it. I feel it. I feel something coming on me. That stone is just so, whoa! Hallelujah! It never happened. It was just another building block to what they were trying to construct. But after they finished, they were all saying, Sir, does the wall look good to you? Because we think it looks good to us. And all of us were satisfied. If they had stopped in the process because that stone just didn't really excite them, I'd still be waiting for the wall. You just keep building. You keep reading. Every day of your life, get in this word. David decided, I need to get in my Bible and find out what I did wrong because God is blessing Obed-Edom's house. What happened with me? He read his Bible and realized, oh, this thing is supposed to be carried on the shoulders of the priests. And there were four rings at the four corners of the ark into which poles were to fit. And these poles were extended out beyond the borders of the ark. And at each corner, a priest was to carry it on his shoulder. David said, my bad. I blew it. God didn't do anything wrong. I blew it. And now the shoulders of the priests were carrying the ark, and it was great. I mean, it was a parade. And for the first time, the Ark of the Covenant was being combined with the monarchial reign in government. It was a seminal moment. It was a huge moment. It was one of the greatest moments in Israel's history. What David says first about this moment is critical. He says this, give thanks. Call upon his name and make known his deeds among the peoples. The title of this message is Primary Words. Primary Words. When I was in the second grade, <clears throat> we had an art class. And we learned in the second grade that there were things called primary colors. And primary colors are the colors that if you tried to combine colors together, you never get them. These colors come straight out of color land. Red, blue, and yellow. No other colors make those colors, but these colors make all other colors. These primary colors allow you the privilege of creating things that don't exist when you combine them together, but without the primary colors, you can't create the beautiful tapestries that are things that we see of, of art. And I'm convinced that David is forming some primary words about how we communicate, what we communicate to God. In this seminal moment, he's trying to help the people of Israel understand something. He's not just overwhelmed with emotion and allowing the, that, that emotion to construct language. He is trying to say, listen to me. In this moment, I am defining how we ought to use our words to properly address God and address people. Listen to what I'm saying. Number one. Be appreciative. Number two, make sure you invoke some things. 
And number three, make sure you, you proclaim. Appreciation, invocation, proclamation. Appreciation, invocation, proclamation. Every day of our life, we need to be grateful people. You don't need to wait for God to do the next thing in your life in order to feel thankful. You need to recognize what he has already done and acknowledge his goodness to your life, even if your life seems to be going down the toilet. If everything seems to be going left when you're going right, if your health is not as it should be, if your money is a little funny, if your occupation is not going as you see fit, if nothing in your life you can look at and say this is unusually blessed, it does not matter because your attitude of gratefulness is not dependent on what God does now nor what he might do tomorrow. Your gratefulness needs to be dependent on what he's already done. Now that was a great point at which you needed to say amen. I'm just letting you know. What he has already done is phenomenal. And though he wants to do so much more for you, if he never does, it should not matter with respect to how grateful you ought to be. You need to get down to the least common denominator on a, on a regular basis. I, I know when my, when my life isn't going the way I want, and I mean I've had so many challenges in my life, none that... Well, let me say, my challenges may not be on the order of what Paul went through. I've never been a day and a night in the sea. I've never been stoned. I've never been beaten with rods. But I have challenges, and those challenges can make me get up less happy than I normally should be. And those challenges can set the tone for my day. And I've decided to not let my soul be, be guided by what's not happening right in my life. Every day when I don't feel as well as I should and I see dark clouds on the horizon of my life beginning to try to overwhelm me, I say, wait a minute. Ha, I ain't going to hell. I am not going to hell. Woo, it's a good day. It's a good day. And all of that encompasses the idea of what God has already done for me if he never does another thing. Gratefulness ought to be the tone that leads my verbiage to him. It ought not be that thing that I add on at the end to sound religious. I'm not coming to God with my latest requests, saying, do this, do that, I need that, I need that, and believe me, I got a lot of needs. When you got seven kids, you got a lot of needs. And I got a church that's a little bit larger than small. It's about the size of this congregation here. And, and pastors always want big churches. I get that. But when you get big churches, you get a lot of people, and they all come with problems. <laughs> all of them. They got a lot of baggage. Now, we would hope that when they come with baggage, it's carry-on. <laughs> that's what you hope. But no, when my people come to my church, you hear the beep, 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 beep. Oh, dude, Really? You got all that? You got to unload your entire truck in our church? Wow, gosh. You want a large church, you get lots of problems. I got a lot to pray over on the regular. But I'm not bringing my request to God before my words are formed with thanksgiving. I lead with this primary color, primary words. Secondly, make sure you call upon his name. That's not just dialing 911 when things aren't as they should be. Call upon his name means to invoke his power and his presence in your present reality. That you don't live life just thinking that God is over here on the side, kind of at a distance superintending over things, and, and somehow you are serendipitously flowing into his blessing. That there ought to be a time where you intentionally say, God need you now I need your power now there are mountains that are in my way that I do not have time to scale nor go around and you said that if this thing would stop the progress of the gospel in my life that I could tell that mountain to be uprooted and cast into the sea I need to invoke your name now in this cir circumstance you begin to call upon his name and bring his will to earth we have that privilege as believers, and rarely do we take advantage of it because we have this case sera, sera attitude. Whatever will be, fait accompli, I can't change my life. Yes, you can. There's some stuff, listen, I don't have time, don't clap. There's some stuff, there's some stuff we can't change. 
And we just have to submit to how God is going to lead us. Paul didn't want to be in, in the sea in a day and a night. He didn't want that. But he found God in the middle of it. But there's some stuff we can see people healed. You bring the name of Jesus into the reality if they're sick. You, you, you begin to pray over your children if they're wayward. Oh, you pray and fast. Lord, I'm believing that your power is going to change the circumstances of my life. You invoke his power and presence into your reality. God doesn't just want to get you to heaven. He wants to bring heaven here. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where? How? He wants his will to come here, not just you to get there. That's why he left us here to change the planet, to help people, and to see his will invoked, his name brought to bear on circumstances that cannot be changed by human invention. Call upon his name, primary color, primary words. Lastly, make known his deeds among the people. The Ark of the Covenant has come in. David is trying to set the tone for how our verbiage ought to be. We need to talk to people about our God. And you may not be Pastor Norman, who is a fabulous communicator. You may not be Billy or anybody else you see here on stage that can put words together in concepts and just do it in such an artistic way that they paint a verbal picture for you that is just astounding. But you have a story, and that story needs to be told. Has God been good to you? Again, not rhetorical. Has God been good to you? Then you need to tell it. Make known what he has done to everybody you know. And when you tell it, don't be weird. We don't need you to start telling it and feel the Holy Ghost tingles. <laughs> don't be weird. Please don't be. Because when you're weird, the people will shy away from you and you'll think, well, they just don't like Jesus. Or, they, they, you know, they may say something that's unkind. You think, well, that's persecution. No, it's you. <laughs> they ain't mad at God. They just don't like you. So don't be weird. Be relevant and figure out a way. You may not have all the chapter and verse, but this is why you need to read your Bible to get chapter and verse. But even if you don't have it, you have something to share about what God has done. Make known his deeds among the people. Primary color, primary word. We need to share what God has done with folk who have no clue. And the reality is the way you got in this is probably somebody decided to share with you something. Return the favor. Pay it forward. Go find somebody who doesn't know anything about God and share your story with them. When we begin to use these primary words, when we are grateful, when we invoke his name into our reality, and when we begin to share with people about what God has done, and we get good at all these things, it's amazing. You won't find one artist who ever uses primary colors only to paint a picture. The beauty is that they use all the primary colors to give the other subtle colors so that they can paint all the subtle T's that are necessary to be able to view the picture that they are trying to portray beautifully. When you get these primary colors down, primary words, you can mix them up however you want and paint the verbal picture that is the beauty and artistry that should be your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I love you. I thank you for your goodness. Have your way with this people. Have your way with this city. Gosh, we love Honolulu. We love Oahu. We love all the isles. Continue to move in this house. Bless this family and pour out your grace as a minister to see this state one. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks for joining us. Visit our website at pearlside.org for more.